Mr. James Seddon joined the Navy intending to be a fighter pilot, only to discover during training how much more awesome it was to drive ships at sea. His 21 years in active duty in the reserves sent him everywhere, from the sands of Kuwait, where he was eaten by sand fleas, to the tropics of Guam, where he was eaten by mosquitoes, and every ocean between here and there. He spent 2009 in Afghanistan trying to locate the waterfront as a dirt sailor, and nowadays he works in IT at a university to fund his writing habit. Please welcome James Seddon. Let's say you're in a ship with catastrophic flooding said the real naval officer sitting across from 17-year-old me. And you'll have to seal this hatch to save the ship. Yet, there are still sailors below the hatch that could be saved from drowning if you kept it open. What do you do? This ROTC scholarship interview was my first interaction with the Navy and my first step to become a naval officer. I was awed and impressed with his uniform. Even idealistic 17-year-old me thought it sounded like a movie script question, though. I answered that I'd close the hatch. After all, if the ship sinks, we'd all drown. I said it with all the conceit of youth's firmly held belief that the right path will always be clear. Yeah, that's great, he said, looking down with a slight sigh and tapping his pen. Then he leaned in, set the paper down, and looked me in the eye. The hard part is in making that decision. It's doing it without knowing whether the ship would really sink if you don't close the hatch, and without knowing whether the sailors could really be saved if you kept it open. You'll be paid to make decisions, and you'll have to do it without the information that you want. At that, all sense of movie stereotypes, along with my confidence, were gone. I discovered early in my career that the warning also applied to things other than sinking ships. Five years later, 22 years old, in 1995, I was in the Northern Arabian Gulf, the Nag, as it's unaffectionately known, roaring across the oil-polluted waters in a vessel under my command, my command. Her haze-gray sides and powerful engines sent us planing over the gentle swells. It was a vessel of the class RHIB, pronounced rib, rigid hull, inflatable boat, what civilians might call a rubber boat. She was a real beauty. The radio call sign of this mighty instrument of national defense was Steel Hammer One. Really, seriously. About as long as a small car, she had a fiberglass hull and inflatable sides. Fill the sides full of bullet holes, she'll float. Drill holes in the rigid bottom, yep, still floats. She was indestructible the only thing the Navy entrusted to the command of a brand new officer, an ensign like me. My crew consisted of a seaman and two petty officers, all enlisted ranks, not officer. The seaman was on his first deployment, like me, and was the only one younger than me. He was my bow hook and handled the lines and radio. One petty officer in his late 20s and on his fourth deployment was my coxswain, responsible for steering the rib. The other was my engineer, responsible for the engine. He was my age, but had been in the fleet, actually deploying while I was chasing girls and doing homework in college. These sailors had flushed more water than I had sailed over, and everyone in the rib knew it. I so wanted to be like them, to earn their respect, and become like them, experienced, salty, competent. I strove to be their ideal officer, by the book, but not too much, whose sailors looked up to and related to and followed to the ends of the earth. I knew I had a long way to go. My crew's mission? Deliver my friend Cunningham, the commo or communications officer, carrying secret radio codes from our anchored American destroyer to the British frigate anchored nearby. The coxswain decelerated as we approached the stern of the frigate. Gladiator, this is Steel Hammer One. Request permission to come alongside I spoke into the model PRC radio, pronounced prick. <laughs> Steel Hammer One, this is Gladiator, permission granted, came the reply, the voice sounding like a Monty Python character. I handed the handset back to the bow hook who normally used the radio. I wanted to make the call to the Brits. It was a cool Navy thing to do. 
The coxswain spun the rib to a stop within reach of the frigate's stern on the first try and made it look easy. If I was at the wheel, we would have rammed her. My bow hook heaved up a line to a waiting British sailor who made it fast to the frigate's deck. Ensign Cunningham? A British officer was looking down at us. Follow me, please. I'll take you to Radio Central. The commo stood on the inflatable side of the rib, took his hand for an assist, and climbed up on the frigate's stern. She stopped and looked back down at me. Back soon, she said. We'll be here, I replied. A British sailor leaned in the shade of an overhang not far from where he had tied us up and lit a cigarette. He was there to stand watch and make sure we didn't just go romping around his ship. The early morning sun was burning through the powder-like dusty haze, warning of the hellish heat to come. For now, it was pleasantly warm. 1995 was a tough time in the nag. I averaged four hours of sleep, split into separate two-hour naps. My ship was busy, enforcing a blockade against Iraq, escorting aircraft carriers for a no-fly zone, spying on Iran, and anxiously watching Iranian military units as they harassed us, guarding other Navy ships while they were at anchor in my park, practicing firing dozens of tomahawks into Iraq. The probability of a real order to do so was high, and today's mission was to get the radio coach to the British frigate so we could do an exercise together and demonstrate international resolve. I was overwhelmed. <laughs> and I felt lucky to be doing it all for real. My ship's captain didn't help the stress, though. He didn't suffer from an overabundance of reasonableness. He had published a 26-point memo listing, literally A to Z, the ways we officers on the ship were messed up, calling several out by name. Screaming in faces was how he expressed his preferences. And after a flag that was not my responsibility and had nothing to do with my watch wasn't displayed properly, he had ripped up one of my formal watch qualifications. He loved making examples out of people. The downtime waiting for the comma was welcomed. I had no duty to perform other than to stay with the rib until she returned. I knew I could get that right. The sun felt warm on the dark blue uniform coveralls I wore, and I pulled my ship's ball cap down over my eyes. This uniform, designed for boat and boarding operations, perhaps on unfriendly ships, was plain with no rank insignia or name on it. I was amused at the thought of getting paid to sit there with my eyes shut. I imagined Uncle Sam with a radio voice announcing, Son, your country needs you. Needs you to sit in the sun. Do it for Mom. Do it for your sweetheart. For Jody and apple pie. My crew were chatting quietly. I kicked my steel toe booted feet up when a British voice interrupted my daydreaming. I heard the Americans had landed. I wanted to come see for myself. You don't look so scary. I peered up under the lid of my ball cap at a short, stocky, young British sailor with a smiling broad face. He was wearing dark blue coveralls with a petty officer's insignia and had his hands in his pockets. You haven't seen us on Liberty, my cox encountered. Some banter ensued between the Brits and my crew, but I stayed out of it. Officers could sometimes shut down conversations with their involvement. So I kept my relaxed pose, hat covered my face, and listened. So it's true you're not allowed to have alcohol on board, the Brit asked. Yep, sad, isn't it, my coxswain said. We were aware that British ships served alcohol. Well then, want to come have a beer? My eyes widened. Yeah, right, said my coxswain. Seriously, I'll take you blokes down to the petty officer mess and show you how Her Majesty's Navy does things. This chap here can watch your boat for you, he said, pointing to the British sailor standing watch. My sailors in the rib slowly turned their eyes on to me. Their faces told me what they thought the answer should be. The heavy weight of command settled on me. First off, a beer sounded really good. Secondly, a beer sounded really good. Thirdly, getting a beer would score serious points with the sailors. Movies portray military officers barking orders to instantly obedient subordinates. In reality, it's a complex relationship. There could come a time when these sailors would be able to cover for me or save me from making a terrible mistake or otherwise help me. Whether they would depended on far more than the rank I held. The time might come when I'd have to order them to do something extremely unpleasant or even dangerous. Rapport built up prior to that situation could be crucial. Yet, I would be violating naval regulations if we had a beer. 
Commanding Officer Standing Orders and Operational Navy Instructions 5350.4 and 1700.16 and the Uniform Code of Military Justice Articles 92, 133, and 134. They all forbid leaving the boat uncrewed, drinking on duty, drinking on a ship, conduct on becoming a gentleman, conduct on bringing discredit, and failing to obey an order, and they all ended in the word court-martial. Court-martial. Career over. Since I was 14, all I wanted to do was be a naval officer. But what were the risks of getting caught? My ship could call on the radio, and we wouldn't be there to answer. I could leave someone behind with the radio, but then someone would be innocent. No, no, best that we're all guilty. <laughs> Stay behind myself and send my crew for a beer? No, I wanted to make sure the drinking didn't get out of hand, plus that would mean no beer for me. One of them might brag about the beer back in the birthing compartment. Word would seep out like a slow leak. The command master chief had a knack for sniffing out that kind of thing. If we got caught, I'd just have to frame it as a bad judgment call. We were sustaining NATO operations through diplomatic means. Ensigns, as brand new officers, were well known for terrible decisions. I'd roll with that. I could say no to the beer. I'd be branded as an uncaring stiff by my sailors. No court-martial, though. No beer, though. <laughs> Careers, court-martials, and beers swirled my head. The ship wasn't sinking, but the officer recruiter told me there'd be days like this. I thought about my future self. Which story would I rather tell after I got out of the Navy? Hand me the prick, I said. <laughs> my sailors shifted with suppressed grins. I guess they were thinking, didn't they teach officers the only prick they should handle is their own? The bow hook handed over the radio. In the name of leadership, I would lie. I called our ship. Steel Hammer, this is Steel Hammer 1, over. I told our destroyer that we were going offline for training, implying that it would be on navigation or safety or engine maintenance or something. It would cover if they called us and we didn't answer. This is Steel Hammer, roger out, came the reply. Smirks turned into smiles. I said, sure, let's go. We'll call it Allied Weapon System Familiarity Training. The inside of the British ship looked like an American ship. Linoleum-like decks, white-painted bulkheads, hatches, knee knockers, fire stations, uncountable wires and pipes, emergency power connections, battle lanterns. The Brit opened a hatch, and we stepped into the petty officer's mess. It was the size of a couple of office cubicles put together and was the lounge for enlisted sailors. There were bar stools along one bulkhead, and along the other bulkhead was a beautiful dark wood bar, just like you'd find at a pub in England only smaller. I'd never seen anything like it on a ship. We settled into the seats and the Brit stepped behind the bar. He started pulling beer glasses out of the holders. I realized how far from the boat and radio we were. Remember, we have to be back at the boat before the commo is, I said. Just a quick beer, said the Brit. Wow, this is real nice, said my coxswain. The petty officers don't even have a mess on our ship. The officers have their wardroom, the chiefs have one. Nothing for us. At that comment, I realized I was in violation of another directive, this one far older. I was an officer in the enlisted petty officer's lounge. Officers were allowed only on strict and rare invitation. It was important for crew sanity to have areas where enlisted members could gather without fear of an officer barging in. This was theirs. I forgot about my lack of rank insignia on my uniform. I was probably the first officer ever to set foot in here. Thanks, said the Brit, as he started pouring beers. We're proud of it. We think it's as good as the chief's mess, though they'd never admit it. But compared to the wardroom, well, you know officers, he rolled his eyes. I didn't hesitate. Yeah, fucking officers. <laughs> My sailors laughed hysterically. The Brit chuckled, but in an awkward way, and handed out his beers. I stretched my arms out, smelled the beer, listened to my sailors talk. For the moment, I forgot where I was. It was relaxing. I lost track of time. There might have been refills. The beer was brown and foamy and luscious. It was good. No, no, it was better than good. It was 
I'm stuck in the nag for months, and the last beer I had was 5,000 miles ago in Singapore, and the beer in Singapore sucked. So to hell with it, Captain, and fuck those regulations. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm drinking on duty. <laughs> kind of good. The voice of God coming from a wall speaker slammed me from my bliss down to the deck. Ensign Sedden, please contact the bridge. My sailors turned and looked at me. Who's Ensign Sedden? asked the Brit. Is that your commo? My crew went silent. My engineer sipped his beer and looked sideways at the wall. Ensign Sedden, please contact the bridge. I pursed my lips. Shit. I pulled a wall phone off its hook. What's the number to the bridge? I asked the Brit. The Brit's smile was gone. His brow was furrowed, and he answered slowly, 47999. This is Ensign Seddon, I said when the bridge answered my call. What the hell, the Brit swore, realizing at once that an officer was in his petty officer mess and that he was helping American sailors break regulations in front of an officer. On the phone, the comma was wondering where the hell we were after having gone down to the boat to find it unattended. I said, we'll meet you there. I turned back to the Brit. He looked like he couldn't decide if I was in trouble with him or if he was in trouble with me. Thanks, I said. This was very awesome, but duty calls, and I extended my hand. A moment passed. Oh, what the hell? Come back any time, he shook my hand, beaming. At the stern, again, I was glad to see the rib was right where we had left it, and horrified to see that the British sailor who was supposed to be watching it was nowhere to be seen. But since it had not come untied or sunk, it was one bullet dodged. When the commo appeared, I said, I'll tell you later. When I finally did, she was pissed. It was totally unfair that I was having a beer while she worked. She never told on us, though, and neither did any of the crew of Steel Hammer One. We never acknowledged it, aside from looks that only insiders can give. On the way back to the ship, I said, I think you saw all those bad teeth back there, so let that be a lesson to us. I think it's probably a really good idea if we all brushed our teeth as soon as we're back aboard and before talking to anyone. <laughs> the coxswain replied, aye, aye, sir. Dental hygiene is very important. Thank you. James Seddon, everybody.